shifting uh, in a certain ways. Um, so as Jenny just mentioned, I lived in several countries. And uh, so the first part of my reading will be uh, ways of seeing as an outsider, as a foreigner, because of course you notice things that locals don't notice or don't want to notice as well. So I'm going to start my reading with uh, my cricket kids. I scan the pitch teeming with Englishmen wearing flannels with wickets and helmets. The aristocratic poise is quaint for my expat size. This is a lazier form of baseball, both noble and debased. This is a gentleman's game, a settler's sport. The China cup skin let their blue blood appear. White colored and starched, they emerge from a Foster novel or Downton Abbey. I scrutinize them with a sardonic smile until I realize my children might play cricket one day, not hurling like their father, nor pelota like me. They will belong to a third culture, one which will escape me like cricket's rules. So another thing that probably didn't escape any of you uh, living in Britain and what I find particularly difficult is the high cost of living compared to Southern Europe. So the next poem is called Alma Mater Studio Room. Nine meter squares, 1200 pounds per month. I'm studying in London, in one of the top, world's top 20 universities, while my partner is pursuing his degree in Ireland and my mother is having cancer treatment in France. But at least prestige compensate for the lack of heating during winter, the boiling temperatures during summer, my credit card being blocked after three days because I had to furnish the studio myself, the stained carpet where previous students puked, the bathroom the size of airplane toilets, the student hall staff storming into the room each month unannounced because we are not allowed to personalize it, the fire alarm exercises in the middle of the night, the lack of any oven, which forces me to constantly cook pasta and defrosted butter chicken. So I, end up, and so I end up with cholesterol at 22, despite walking to uni every day to save the bus fare. But I keep on studying. I must keep on studying, even if I'm sick of being locked up in nine, nine meter squares. I must read academic books all day under the blanket, wearing two sweaters, because I love this degree because this college's acceptance rate, rate is 13%, because my grandparents stopped attending school age 13, because my father stopped talking to me for three months when he thought I would drop out. I must hold on because people make me believe this situation is perfectly acceptable, even desirable, no pain, no gain. So I read to the Plath and start writing poetry in English to preserve my sanity. But I realize on Easter Sunday that instead of having a family lunch, I'm writing essays in a nine meter square studio in front of a Pope's broadcast speech, all in the name of prestige, my window overlooking lead and concrete buildings, the sky the color of a lamp with stained wool. So once you've lived abroad and you come back to your country, you become an outsider because there are so many things you've been used to, you've seen differently. Sometimes it's difficult to adjust again. So I moved back to France at some stage. And when the second time I lived in London, I happened to end up in the French borough without knowing it. And there was really a contrast because it was really all this very rich French expats, whereas I wasn't rich at all. So I, was, I loved observing them from afar. The French women of Fulham. Each morning, the French women of Fulham do cardio in the park next to the French school where the French children are pupils. Did they enroll them there, there because they believe in the superiority of a French educational system or to preserve their Frenchness? The French women of Fulham hired a personal coach. He makes them trot around like mares trained for dressage. Did they give up their careers to follow their husband entrepreneurs abroad? None of them is over 40. They know they are temporary. Après l'effort, le réconfort. 
a French woman of Fulham sit on the terrace of a cafe overlooking the muddy park. Sipping their steaming noisette in the damp autumn morning, they recreate a little Paris. One complains, complains about her British sister-in-law. She gave me a candle for Christmas. It's the kind of present you offer when you don't give a damn about the person. Another one sighs, I never thought I would miss watching the Bastille Day military parade on TV. In a few years time, they will drive for two hours each morning to bring their children to the posh Lycée Francais in Kensington. No more cardio in the park. This is Pikachu in the Musée d'Orsay. In the Musée d'Orsay restaurant, sitting on modern Murano glass chairs under an art deco ceiling, two Chinese tourists in their 50s play Pokemon Go, catching Pikachus between two courses. They've ordered fish and chips in a chic French museum and the Parisian waiter makes them pay for it. He serves the next dish before they finish the first, so their fish gets cold before they can start eating it. He treats all the Asian customers this way. Shrugging shoulders, he renders us complicit by saying, if I poured them some Coke instead of wine, they wouldn't notice. So I write a lot about mass tourism because my hometown is very touristic and I lived in Paris and London. And um, I think mass tourism raises interesting issues, ethical issues such as um, the housing crisis in created some places, you know, with Airbnbs being spreading everywhere, or even ecological issues like um, Venice, famously. So this is my own tourist Venice poem. Three other ways to look at Venice. One. The morning mist covers the alabaster Persian palace with Mudehar windows. Piazza San Marco is a souk pierced by a campanile with a pyramid at the top. The Byzantine basilica resembles the Arabian Nights and Cinderella's castle, an eclectic Alibaba's den. While you order your Turkish coffee, I recall Granada's walls above the gondolas. Two. The light is different here, crenellated. The firmaments filtered, the ivory buildings where seagulls merge mirror their pallor. Waves shatter on candy cane stilts and the stench of stagnant water spreads. The crowded wooden bridge to the Academia looks like Da Vinci's flying machine. The narrow streets suck up throats. The masks of Goldoni's characters and Picasso's unstructured Harlequin can be found in any craftsman shop. Locals depicted by Longhi are rare. Tintoretto's shades of indigo, Veronese's water green, and Team Polo's salmon pink are dabbed all over the town's palettes. Yet it is your eyes which epitomize the lagoon. Three. The skiff's motors awoke us instead of car traffic. We wanted to eat Shylock's chiketti for our second anniversary in the Jewish ghetto, a succession of stacked Rubik's cubes. We had lunch in front of buoyant buses and taxis along Canaragio's keys, the picturesque canal copying bayons. For our departure, the lagoon mingled with the sky, the railway reached the world's edge, the deadly waterfall. The earth was flat again. So again, about tourism, you know, we tend, and I include myself in it, we tend to be all guilty about projecting uh, what our stereotypes of the local culture or traditions uh, a lot when we visit a new place. So a Maiko, by the way, is an apprentice geisha. So this is what strikes me about the Maiko. It is the way she positions her thumb, waxed under the index. Her hands, flat flints, flicking around. The mark at the back of her neck, a manta painted with a stencil. When she pauses to capture the essence of the scenery, her disproportionate wingspan and the fans cleaving the air. 
The fact that she dances in front of an audience who doesn't fathom the depth of her art. Her blatant resignation when she pauses with tourists who believe she's no more than an escort. So finally, I'm going to conclude with uh, ways of seeing the past because I write a lot about the historical past because I'm interested in history or my own family's past. So I've selected two poems from, yeah, dealing with that. So first it's very common language. When my great grandparents wanted to communicate without being understood by their five children who could speak French and Basque, they switched to Spanish, moved 6,000 miles away, 20 years earlier, back to Buenos Aires. My great-grandmother had to follow her homesick parents back to France. She lost her country and her freedom. My great-grandfather left when he was drafted for the Great War. He lost a country and a leg. What were they saying to each other in Spanish? Did they resurrect a life that was never meant to be? Finally, uh, so this poem, you know, is in divided into two, there are two voices of so the left, the, all the stanzas on the left are from the child's perspective and then the mother's perspective. So this is my final poem, Red Card. Tonight is the final of the FIFA World Cup and France is playing against Italy. I'm watching the match with Granny while mom is watching it in a psychiatric hospital. I hate football, but there's nothing else to do. The guy who believed is Jesus started preaching in front of the TV, but we made him fuck off. The French are wearing white because the Italians are dressed in navy blue. They've even stolen our colors. I can't hear the commentators. Karine keeps on talking to me about the fetus the doctors never removed inside her belly, the one shriveled like an autumn leaf. Materazzi insults Zidane with a figlio di putana to push him over the edge. My husband refused to meet the psychiatrist. My mother and daughter come every day. I told the staff I wanted to be alone. Zidane gives him a swift headbutt. Red card! Zidane is sent off. We all know each other's pathology. Vivian hears voices. Francois tried to take his own life after his wife left with a baby. Leticia talks about her bipolar disorder. I make sure my daughter avoids the pedophile in the hall. Bloody Italians, such cheaters. Granny is outraged too. I've been with her for a week and when mom is back, we will live the three of us together without dad. The psychiatrist never utters a word. He just gives pills. I can only count on myself. The two teams are tied, they play extra time. I knew I was ill, but I thought the social services would take my daughter away if I went to rehab. Trezeguet misses his penalty, so the team loses the shootout. Dad told me mom went to the hospital because of her nerves. Nerves have always failed the French. The first days I refused to get out of my room. I convinced myself I wasn't like the other patients. My friends call me the comeback queen. I'm going to leave this hospital after two weeks and I'll never relapse. Thank you, everyone. Am I on time, Jenny? Great. So here it is. Let me stop. Ooh. How do I stop sharing? Ah, here we go. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for uh, Jilly's uh, wonderful poems. And uh, I noticed uh, lots of very new works as well. So that's very exciting to hear. Um, so thanks a lot. And um, we'll, you know, I'm sure that we'll ask you lots of questions later on as well about it. And um, so now we're going to um, introduce Claire, um, Claire Collinson. Um, so Claire, um, she is an honorary, um, she's actually the joint winner of the inaugural Women Poets Prize. Um, and she's been placed second in the Winchester Poetry Prize as well, and in the 
um, Resurgence Prize, now Ginkgo Prize, and Hippocrates Prize. Um, her first novel was a finalist in the Dundee Book Prize, and Claire has worked as a creative copywriter and arts editor for a disability arts magazine. Her short stories, nonfiction, and poetry have been widely published in anthologies and in magazines online uh, and in print. She uh, also teaches creative writing uh, um, and combines visual art and writing practices and was the first Max literary, uh, sorry, literacy resident at Kettle's Yard, Cambridge. Um, so welcome Claire, thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Jenny. Thanks for the introduction. I loved your poems, Julie. I really enjoyed listening to those. I could have just sat there listening to those all evening. Um, okay, I'm going to try and share my screen. Fingers crossed. Yay, can everyone see that okay? So, um, I thought we'd start with something a bit meta. Um, as Sleuth Jenny had uncovered this, and I was in, I'd was i been thinking about this poem and thinking about reading it, so that seemed the perfect excuse to start with this one. Um, Zooming the Cousins. Someone says, if there are more than can share a pizza, there's too many. So we discuss pizza because food is in our blood. And sewing, the nap of velvet draws a consensus. Once, their mum said I'd put up my hem with a trowel. My youngest cousin is showing us her dog nail, screen full of licking and fur. And I remember us driving to meet her the night she was born, how she came out of my auntie with long nails. My sister is on mute, but we're up to speed, although her wallpaper is new. We are game show gridded with our choices and soft furnishings and discerning what that means. We have slept in rows in shared beds, but not recently. The screen simplifies us and I compare the lines of our brows to see what the men added to our matriarchal stock. And there's so much goodwill and curiosity and of course, a yearning for our mothers who connected us. I remember their pine kitchen table with two long benches, the way my auntie could draw a rose, how the water tasted in their taps. So, uh, just one second, I can't see anything here. Um, Jenny, is everything going okay? Can you see? Can you see my screen? Can you see the, the screen share okay? I'm still seeing zooming the cousins. Uh, so maybe right, that's okay. Okay, so I I should be shifting it down. Can you see the next one coming up? Yep. Brilliant. Thanks. Okay. Good. So, um, uh, I, I've selected my poems along the lines of all different kinds of ways of seeing, um, which should become sort of self-apparent. Um, they include looking to understand um, appearance, being looked at, scrutinized, and visualizations and the power of looking as a tool. I went to a conference at the Welcome Collection um, called Placebo, and this poem's a kind of Ars Poetica, um, which is, it, it is what it does. So um, I'm going to give you a little visualization. Placebo. I am giving you an, a lemon. Here, feel its weight, its pitted yellow peel. I'm giving you a knife. Cut the lemon into quarters. See how lemony it looks inside. Feel the saliva pooling. 
So from there, I'm going to go on to another visualization. And the title comes from a film that made a big impression on me and certainly informed how I, um, I, I feel about my, my inner workings. Uh, it's a film with, uh, with Raquel Welsh, who was miniaturized and injected into a man's body to get something, I don't know what, but the idea of these, these organs and all the things that were in the body really made a massive impression. So this is, um, this is Fantastic Voyage. This is still your biology, entered through blood, exited via a tear duct. Your interiors are pleated ranunculus, your organs epic Victorian waterworks, or white formica. Cells are always sweet-shaped, lozenge, fruit pastel, tic-tac, and antibodies rudimentary, loyal as dogs. Um, I'm moving on to probably the poem I've read more times than any other, and I guess at some point I should retire it, but I thought it's so appropriate for this theme that uh, it had to have a final outing. <laughs> so uh, here we go, The Ladies' Pond. Days before the mastectomy, you return to the heath to swim again while you can. It's May Day and people are flying kites. There's a dog show with celebrities, obedience tests, novelty cakes. The pond is still as cool and green. You drop down rungs this time, watching your limbs porcelain. Sunlight slips through the tree perimeter mottling you, and you remember when you dove from the board over and over, half your lifetime ago. It was dawn and you were naked, very two-breasted, very avant-garde. The old woman was pond from the neck down. When she ordered you into the water, you complied the way a child would. I'm not a prude, she told you later in the changing room, where now two girls half your age, glowing from their impromptu dip, blot themselves on leaves of pink financial times. I mean, look, she said, peeling off her swimsuit without fuss. You can't remember much about the scars, beyond her attitude. Look, she said, dismissing them. The scars were old and she was old and she was here and swimming, pond from the neck down. The next poem is uh, set during the, um, I, was, I was diagnosed with, with breast cancer in 2014 and undertook a summer of chemo, and this is from there. Chemo with Sharapova. The woman reading Juno Diaz under the TV has adjusted to her losses elegantly. Penciled in eyebrows, mulberry skull cap, diverting silver jewelry, Wimbledon hovers above her like a thought bubble. My daughter's sent a court, another woman says. Hard to imagine clouds scooting the aperture, the acoustic. Her husband is waiting for test results. This could be the final, he says, munching a biscuit. Sharapova serves, her opponent returns. I am as alert to curves and smoothness now as a pubescent boy, their jelly tot nipples and dull sleek crotches, the double bounce of a ponytail. Sorry. 
the double bounds of a ponytail. A nurse called Aisha tells the man he's neutropenic. His wife lets out a moan like Sharapova. We gasp at the rotten call, nostalgic for recently, when we were gloriously stupid. Sorry, I knew that um, I'd, I'd trip myself up with screen sharing, but I hope not too distractingly. Um, so I started with a um, Zoom lockdown poem and uh, we're back into the pandemic with the flag. Uh, this oh, just about fits on the page if I'm careful. Yeah, yeah sorry about this. The flag. You're desiccated, you tell the woman from the Lido. It's she, and she replies, oh, yes, and carries on along the queue that trails all the way up Josephine Avenue towards the lucky post box. But you suspect she has a second home by a lake, and you hate her for a good moment. And when you're let into Sainsbury's, you buy bubble bath to compensate. They only have baby stuff, so you go for the organic with raspberry. And this morning you speed read an article, no, a link to an article, on body shame, and run a bath that smells of sweets, and remember your father, who ran you bubble baths once a fortnight, how good at it he was, and proud. There's a trick to getting the air in, fingers splayed, creating bigger bubbles that disappear faster. And after your bath, all baby fresh, you decide on beans on toast. You wrap yourself in the white waffle dressing gown you stole from the Marriott Hotel gym at County Hall when they had an off run and you'd just finished chemo. You got in the lift and it was full of Miss World contestants who, it transpired, were competing nearby. They all had lustrous hair and you were still bald. You walked into the changing rooms and there was a woman with her back to you using the mirror inside the locker door for her makeup. And she saw you and shrieked and turned to say, no, you should not be here. Then realized and tried to cover her mistake. And you felt awful that she felt awful, but you also felt awful. And you take the plate to the table, but your fork catches the toast, catapulting beans and there's bean juice everywhere, all over the white waffle dressing gown, which you realize is hubris. A pool of beans has collected between your clean thighs. And now you look like the Judy Chicago photo, the one with the tampon and your white waffle dressing gown will need soaking in the bath water you just let out. Um, this is a poem about being in transit in all different kinds of ways. And it's, um, it's a penultimate and then it's one slightly longer, which is also about finishing with a journey. So um, here we go. You were served today by Janka. In transit, we are all suggestible. It is this unplace causes us to order oysters. So when she mutters eyebrows, you stop. Yes, you'd like some. You have time and you have no eyebrows. You lost them, you tell her, as she settles you on the high stool. She peers, assessing. The eyebrows she has for you will be impermanent, won't wipe off when you sweat. You sweat, you tell her, because of the side effects. Her brush on your brow tickles. She has a tiny diamond in her front tooth. You see it after you close your eyes. So I'm going to finish with um, a poem about um, 
being on a plane, being at 38,000 feet, which is where I was yesterday. Um, 38,000 feet. These days, you are leaky with joy. The Malachite ponds are enough to set you off. You twist in your seat, blink damp eyes over fields shaped by inheritance, away from the girl sat next to you who has never flown and who squeals, que chulo, que guay. You have the window seat, but try to share the oval of wonder with her. Lean over, take pictures on your smartphone. Look, snow. Today, you are slathered in airport unguents. You are age-defying and light-headed. You love the stewardess's French pleat. You want to tell the girl in her distressed Union Jack t-shirt, stash these glowy clouds, memorize this light. It is always like this up here. Up here, you could believe in God, but she has put on her headphones and is studying her itinerary. On Wednesday, she will visit Greenwich. Thursday, the Horse Guards Parade. Below you, the car park shimmers. Thank you. That's brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Claire. Um, it's just wonderful to hear all these poems and uh, very powerful and um, so much like, you know, capture those moments like uh, really incisively beautiful. Thank you. Um, and our next reader, it's um, Catherine, Catherine Beffers. Um, she is a, a neurodivergent poet and poetry teacher and founder of the Writing School Online, and she was Hampshire poet in 2020 to 21. And um, she's also the selected poet for Magma, uh, and her poems have appeared widely in magazines, including Poetry Wales, Poetry Island Review, Miss Lexi and London Magazine. And she, um, she has also recently headlined alongside Patience F. Barbie at Winchester Poetry Festival, and is working on her, uh, her poetry collection. Um, please welcome uh, Catherine. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jenny. It's it's such a privilege to, you know, to read with Julie and and Claire and Daniel, and and just an, yeah, a privilege actually to hear this work, this this meaningful, this often quite painful work that that we're kind of witnessing and honouring tonight. So thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, when I think about the topic, I love this topic that you that you've got for this evening. You know, ways of seeing. For me, it kind of really relates to uh, the topic of permission, and the permission that we give ourselves as poets on an ongoing basis to write or not write about certain topics. Um, I really love what Kathleen Jamie has to say about this in an essay uh, she published in 2000 called Holding Fast, uh, Truth and Change in Poetry. She writes, much of writing is about permission I mean here the long process of becoming a poet of any authority. Each development in our writing begins when we seek permission to approach it, to approach a new area of experience. She asks, may we plunder the past, reveal the secret histories of our lovers and families, be intellectual, be a poet at all. Uh, it's a courtesy which at times hardens into a moral question, this may I. Um, and this may I is something I ask myself all the time. May I write about this? Is it OK to write about this? Is it OK to share this work publicly? Um, I think, I, you know, in recent years, I've, I've tried to become bolder and, and truer about my own ways of seeing, particularly as a neurodivergent um, person, someone on the autistic spectrum, um, by using a number of tactics um, and strategies to fool myself that it's OK. 
Um, one of those is voice, so I shape shift a lot in poems. So I'll share a few poems tonight that, that use that, yeah, that kind of dramatic monologues essentially. Um, the second way I tend to use this kind of surrealist narratives, often mixed with humor, helps me to get away with a lot. Um, and the third way by kind of jamming together two elements maybe that don't seem to belong like you know um i don't know knitting and grief or bird watching and and love um and and that helps me to kind of through the pressure of the poem the world of the poem to make those two things indivisible um and kind of allows me to explore territory that's maybe a bit more um emotionally dangerous than i might let myself if i weren't writing at it in that slant way. Um, let me share my screen then and I'll start reading the poems lecture over. <laughs> Can everyone see that okay? Great, so um, the first thing I think that, that, you know, using another voice, you're stepping into another pair of shoes, becoming a different, person, creature, whatever, uh, is, is just for the joy of it. I always think of that Caroline Bird quotation from, I think it's from How to Be a Poet, where she says, writing a poem is impossible. And once you realise this, you're free. <laughs> so this is a poem that very much, I hope, kind of has some of that joy to it. It's called Starlings. In the beginning is the sky deep, and the sky deep is shapeless and hollow, and blankness dwells there. And the body us broods over the belly of the horizon, clinging to skeletons of trees. And we say, let there be wave trail. And there is wave trail. And we divide the wave trail from the sky deep and the outpour from the in-shrink. And we call the wave trail, we are. And we call the sky deep, it is. And we say, let there be curl smoke in the midst of the sky swim and let it divide the we are from the it is. And we fashion the curl smoke from the sky swim and it is so. And we call the curl smoke one and the sky swim we call many. And we say, let the break wave be heard among the many and the pebble rush also. And we call the break wave flesh and the pebble rush we call spirit and thus it is then we say let the spirit be divided into the sky bright we will call light and the out snuff we will call darkness and let darkness bring about a great shitting upon the earth and we say let darkness herald the downpour and the stench sweet the dirt roost and the clutch heart and so it goes Glory be to the sky deep and the body us, the curl smoke and the sky swim. Glory be to the break wave and the pebble rush, the dirt roost and the out snuff. For we are the many, we are the one. The other thing that body snatching <laughs> by using different voices allows you to do is to explore politics. And for me, sexual politics, um, to write about female desire, the I want in the female voice in a way that I find, I do, I find really hard to do in my own kind of lyric poet, first person voice, but find easier to do by, by kind of stepping into someone else's shoes. Wonder Woman questions her status as a 70s symbol of female empowerment. All my villains like to tie me up. They lick their lips and salivate. My body, a shining slice of cherry cheesecake. My breasts, twin spaniels off the leash. The bouncy castle of my thighs. Despite my strength and speed and near invulnerability to pain, there's nothing new. The unpaid labor, crazy hours, saving the world from boys will be boys one sleaze bag at a time. They dress me up as July the 4th, spangled hot pants, red heeled boots, my cape, a parody of stars and stripes. This bustier, please. Eagle wings unfurl feathers like fingers grappling each scarlet silken boob. 
Spider-Man and Superman get mega bucks for half the degradation I endure. No rule to smile for them, no imperatives for warmth, no spinning themselves on the tanning bed, kebab meat on a spike. I was given my script from birth, rehearsed for the role from It's a Girl, trained to preach our need for female solidarity while whirling my tits around like mushroom volivons on a tray. Fuck that. I want to take up room. I want to spread my legs on the subway, hurl my voice, to scowl whenever the hell I please. It comes to this. I want to meet the eye of any man and feel no fear. Get me scotch on the rocks, my coffee hot. Get me the biggest slice of key lime goddamn pie you've got. Go. Apprehend your creeps. I want my sweetbread skinned and a big white bed that's empty, safe for me. I think during kind of lockdown, early lockdown anyway, the first one, I was scrambling around for things to write about and found it quite fun to, um, to write about things in the house. <laughs> so this is about a nest of Russian dolls. You know, those ones you pop them open and open and open, get smaller and smaller and smaller until you reach that little one inside who doesn't do much of anything. And again, this is written in a kind of plural first person voice. Matryoshka. We're all in the family way, full of ourselves. In the pudding club, my dear. On our shelf, we gather dust like snowfall and listen to the sound of human children growing. Their girls, once born, are great squishy, smelly things that puke and puke and shit the sodding bed. Not ours. We are a nest with all our pretty chicks inside. We are the hatchling and the egg. Each of us is mother to a daughter who is pregnant with the next in line. Our bodies rhyme like the faces of the moon. All except our smallest. We don't talk about it, but let me say it softly. She was born with no space inside. That's right, she's wood all the way through. It's not that we judge her, understand, but that we know, as only mothers can, she'll never get to split herself in two. She'll never have to bear the others, as we do. And the final thing I should really say about this one, trigger warning, you can see from the title, um, this is about termination of pregnancy. I know it's a really difficult topic for some people. Um, so now might be a good time to get a cup of tea if this one really isn't for you. Um, but one of the things that a dramatic monologue can allow you to do is to do something really taboo. Um, I'll just read you this one. In which I imagine my aborted fetus sings to me. When I was a bird inside your body's cage of gold, I'd swing, umbilical, bound by a fibre's span. I ate your bread, drank from your communion cup. I was bright new bones and blood. When I worshipped, it was in your chapel, slipping and soaring in a pool of stained glass light. Listen to me. I have known paradise, have learnt by heart your heartbeat song. In your garden, it was always summer, and I stitched myself together under the apple tree. No thought, no fruit forbidden, no act unclean. For that quickening time, you were entirely mine. I was your well wound spool your coil of line that binds. So making that shift over now to, again, kind of thinking about permissions and what am I allowed to write about. Um, I've been writing a bit more recently about intimate partner violence. 
um, whether that's emotional or financial or physical or whether it takes the form of gaslighting or any other form I've, I'm interested in writing about that uh, and I'm coming from a position of experience on some of that so again there was this big taboo about am I allowed to write about this what if my exes read this that, that kind of worry um, so it helped me to use the surreal narrative to write about it. Obviously, I've just given the game away and this will be all over YouTube at some point, but never mind. Um, it's called Teddy. Delia suspected that her teddy bear was gaslighting her, but found it hard to pin down when he had begun. Was it when he said her new hat looks like an animal crawled onto your head and died there? Or when he made her say hot water bottle? over and over, calling her accent adorable. How the other toys at the tea party laughed. Teddy said none of the other bears was good enough for Delia. Not the best version of her, the version only he could help her work toward. Paddington liked to spliff. Pooh was pretentious. Rupert was holding her back and little Ted made her laugh too much and act like a crazy person. Order was important to Teddy. When he woke her at 1am, growling for picnic food right there, right then, Delia thought that something was maybe not okay. He made a list of silly words that she used, serviette and seti, toilet and cheers. When she began to avoid bedtimes, got puffy drinking late into the night, Teddy said, there's more of you to love. He didn't do snuggles anymore. One time he rocked up on a girl's night out with the, with the rag dolls, saying her lateness home showed you don't respect the value of other people's time. It wasn't all bad. Teddy taught her the difference between less and fewer, it's and it's, no and yes. He was good at rules and there was much that Delia still needed to learn. So this is the second uh, kind of bad guy poem. I really love this. I loved writing this one. The nice thing about Teddy and the Smuggler is that even though they're based on really horrible experiences and kind of trauma actually is how much fun they were to write and how they kind of gave me what Louise Gluck calls a revenge over circumstance. Um, that was another quotation that Caroline Bird introduced me uh, to, I'm a big fan of hers. The Smuggler. She knew she'd need to start off small, so took the spoons. What a boon easing silver necks from their rosy velvet trays into her tinkling sleeves. He only picked at his guitar with filthy nails, inhaled another toke of weed. Next, she snuck out lamps and lampshades, ceiling roses, bulbs. She stashed them quietly in her boot. What a hoot. He simply frowned put on his head torch, watched five episodes of Top Gear, sucked a six pack down. Last week, she slipped the curtains from their poles, how droll, then slid the windows from their sockets, bubble wrapped the glass and hid the views inside her pockets. He shrugged, pulled on the jumper, filled his bong with grass. Today's his birthday, and she's carried off the roof, the rafters, chimney pot. So what? This time, he's shouting at the wind, fists raised to the stars. It's nothing new, this. The fists, the shouting, the shouting fists. She's taken it for years. Tonight, she's packed up firelight, shadows, warmth, and headed south. Of all the things she ever took, it was her ma's advice that got her out. She'll reach home soon. Oh, him? Look, he's still there, crouched on all fours, howling at the moon. So another uh, surreal narrative. This I wrote, gosh, beginning of lockdown again. Um, 
And I was thinking a lot about the environmental crisis. I was thinking about the pandemic. God, it was just, I was on my phone so many hours a day, it's embarrassing to admit the number, just doom scrolling constantly. Um, and this one kind of came out of that, as a, I guess, again, as a kind of lighthearted way of trying to express some of the collective trauma we were all feeling. And I think it plays in a bit to the energy crisis that we're obviously going through now as well. The darkening. It started with glowworms and phosphorescent fish, their lights blown out like candles on a cake. A matinee's footlights swallowed themselves entire, so we only guessed poor Gloucester's eyes were gouged and heard Leah shake his fists against the storm. Momentum took, bulbs began to organize, to unionize, down tools across the globe. Lighthouse beams refused to stroke the sea to sleep. Whole tower blocks played dead, their pupils blown. By tea time, even the bloodlit freckles of TV standby LEDs had mutinied. Dentist lamps sat down, sat in, called sick. We blame the manufacturers. We blame the government. Street lamps picketed the roads on which they lived. We knew we were screwed when matches joined the strike. Flints declined to spark, magnifying glasses wouldn't catch. Oil lamps, tapers, flambeau took up arms. Conspiracy theorists had their day at last. Doom scrolling our darkened screens tonight, we are undone. We pray for dawn's red eye to open. Watch as stars put out their fires one by one by one. And then that third strategy I spoke about, the, the kind of jamming two things together that don't seem to belong um, as a way of seeing things differently, seeing things new. Um, so this is a poem uh, about my Nana, Mary Bevis, Knitting Nana. I cast her on with double pointers, Sheffield steel. First, I do her slippers in shabby worsted wool, alternate rows of knit and pearl. Then up the tan support stockings that always rib around her ankles. Her shins are fiddly. Their cabled veins require another same gauge needle, slipping stitches back and forth. I pause for a mug of tea, a custard cream, before I tackle the vast loose landscapes of her hips, belly, thighs. My needles click like tiny typewriters and she spools from them. Her fair aisle of stretch marks, her bingo wings. I knit the screeching polyester dress she wore to clean the step, knit her freckled hands, her wedding band, knit the tumour nestling in her breast. When I reach the last stitch of her blue rinse shampoo and set, she casts herself off. Now, she lies in my lap as I once did in hers. Her neck's soft crepe, that trace of B&H, the shrill acrylic of her voice. And kind of keeping in the spirit of jamming th two things together. So I suppose this is a love poem, um, but written kind of with birds in mind. Um, the next two poems actually do this. They're poems really about love, but they speak either about nests or about bird watching as a way to do that. Um, and these will be my final two poems. So just a thank you again to Jenny Wong for inviting me. Um, and just, a, yeah, just brilliant to, to read with such other brilliant poets tonight. A wedding. That day, the thrushes finally fledged. For weeks I'd heard his whistled songs to her at dawn. Now, 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 did he do it, did he do it? Then watched her plunge into the hedge, bearing grass, roots and moss to pearl with a busy beak. She stamped the floor with tiny feet, fed the cup with mud and spit, pressed her speckled belly to the curve until it grew the contours of a bird. As we sent out invitations to the feast, she laid a clutch of brilliant turquoise eggs. Day after day, she sat and hatched her bulge-eyed brood. 
It was a wide-beaked time. It wore her sad and thin. I'd see them both smashing snails against an anvil, fetching wet meat to their young. Then June came. As I stepped into my dress, mother fastened silk covered buttons with her crochet hook and the last chick tottered at the nest's lip. I held my breath. It fluttered, stretched and flew. I brought the lice infested nest indoors to find a tangle of your hair strung gold against the brown. We have it still, her parting gift. It stinks of food, of flesh, this living mess, this coracle of scraps. Final poem then. Um, this one is for, um, for Ollie. Honeymooners Guzzle. You teach me the name of each bird, my love, and I test on my tongue every word, my love. A red shank now boomerangs in towards shore where her water flute cry can be heard, my love. At Mulhead's rocky ledge, dark cormorants stand and survey the white spume churn to curd, my love. A gannet's beak pierces the linen of mist pulling fast an invisible cord, my love. When a sea fret blows in from the coast, then exhales, once again you're beside me, unblurred, my love. A crow in a hood flaps its course into school round the cliffs of Deerness, undeterred, my love. These kitty wakes glide, they trace rings with their wings, and your voice is the air that they've stirred my love. Thanks so much everyone. Thank you very much. Um, this, the, um, this really, oh, speechless, that's just like so powerful, your poetry. Um, uh, thank you very much, Catherine, for like, you know, like it's just um, so um, tackling really difficult subjects as well and um, in very experimental ways. Um, and uh, such honesty. Thank you so much for, for uh, being here and uh, we'll come back to your work later in the questions and answers. Um, and um, I, I think uh, we should all check out your poetry. Um, and uh, so uh, it's really delightful also to, um, you know, introduce Daniel Sluman, who doesn't need much introduction actually, but um, um, just going to give a brief, um, you know, uh, Men, 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 you know, a summary of his uh, brilliant work. Um, so uh, Daniel, um, he was born in Gloucestershire and where he gained a first in his BA in English at University of Gloucestershire. And, oh, sorry, I just uh, lost my page. Um, and the distinction in his MA at the um, same university. Um, Daniel has also co-edited the first major UK disability poetry anthology, Stairs and Whispers, um, definitely worth uh, looking at, and um, Disabled Poets Write Back with Sandra Allen and Karani Baraka. He has previously held editing roles at IOTA and Dead Inc. Um, he has studied towards a PhD in disability poetics funded by HLC Award from Midland Free Cities. His, um, his collection, Single Window, published by Nine Arches Press in 2021, was shortlisted for T.S. Eliot Prize, and we're so happy and proud for you. <laughs> um, so uh, let's welcome Daniel. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction, Jenny. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, who's, who's read so far. It's been fantastic. Um, I'll share my screen now with you, and hopefully um, it'll work. There we go. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so, yeah, the, the kind of theme for today was ways of seeing. And it's really interesting seeing, I think, a, a number of us have some shared experiences that maybe we'll be able to talk about a bit. Um, but I'll I'll talk a little bit more about um, the my most recent collection, Single Window, in a second. I'll read the, the first poem from it um, to begin with, Single Window. We watch documentaries on mute from the sofa we've lived in for the last eight months. The frames crash over us, the colors, the names, 
the stories rip and merge and we don't sleep or we sleep all day. When we finally pull back the curtain, a slant of rain is leaning against the road, slick with rotting leaves. Autumn smoulders everything back to its roots, spoils it to a hazy gauze of yellows and browns. We count down the seconds before our pills sing their gospel inside us. We rock in our seats, eyes rolled back towards the heaven of improved conditions all animals must maintain, however small, however distant it becomes. All day we drink tea piled with sugar and wake in yesterday's clothes to this piss bright sunrise. And our daily bread is to not let ourselves bend or break under the weight of this light. So um, my, my last collection was written pre-COVID, but it was during a time when myself and my wife um, we're both disabled. We couldn't access the stairs to our house, so we spent um, pretty much all all day, every day, living off a sofa in a living room. And the one window that linked us to the outside world was our only kind of connection with with what was going on outside. Um, this next poem explores that a little bit more and the idea of the domestic and the everyday. Ash. When I wake. It's with a lit cigarette hung between my lips or loose, rolling past startled fingers into the blankets folds. This vice of a cough, my plot of careless stars singe through cotton. These tiny wrecks in the sheet we shake out in the garden, letting summer pour through each blunder, every lapse hollowed and held in fabric. Another week in this heat and the junk mail piles at the door. Voicemails gather, spilt over in our phones and scatterings of ash mark a route to where I lie on the sofa, my body on fire. Usually I don't have to explain um, at a reading that I'm an amputee because I'm, I'm used to doing readings in person and it's, it's very apparent. Um, but I had bone cancer when I was 11 and I had a very rare amputation done to save my life um, called a hip disarticulation, which is where you, you cut basically at the point of the hip. And um, it's kind of affected the majority of, of my life in various ways. But in terms of the poems I'm, I'm talking about, my wife also has Crohn's disease and fibromyalgia. And so we both have this intermingling of um, different bodily and mental performance, depending on, on what day we're in. This is dusk. Dusk spills through the curtains and carves the room out with light. The pan of burnt eggs soaking in the sink. The stale smell of yesterday's weed. Huddled in the corner of the room, the inflammation flickers in your joints like a wasp fraught in the folds of a curtain. A single finger swipes the screen of your phone, drawing the last two years of our life before you image by image. The sky outside swells like a bruise drawn through a poultice and you're dug into the duvet, waiting for the codeine to bloom inside you. The pharmacology of love is guesswork. Night follows day here in diminishing returns. And all I want is to keep as much of you for tomorrow. As an amputee, one of the um, ways I was thinking about in, in terms of today's theme, ways, ways of seeing, one of the things I was thinking about was how my disability presents myself to the world and what it means in terms of my relationship with my wife as well. Um, this poem is about those themes and about um, what it's like to have something, a very vulnerable part of you that you can't shy away from the other person. Stump. 
Like a saint, you kiss the sickliest part of me. Eyes shut. The rings slide carefully from your fingers until they spill and settle on the table. Ponytail drawn tight against your scalp. Your palms oiled. The fine hair on my stump glowing as you stretch your hands over all this hurt. The stunted hip bone and its crest of thickened scar. Your knuckles smoothing knots from the sluggish muscles that no longer flex the hip into a half smile. I imagine the phantom limb pouring into your palms like water. All the cruel words and shame thrown into the space where my legs should be. Pulled out like barbs. This is how it feels to have your trauma held. I tell you, your kindness kills me. Your grace kills me. Your soft lips pressed against this void kills me again and again. Being loved by you is like turning the volume up so high you can't hear yourself breathe. One of the things I, I often talk about in this readings is, um, is care because myself and my wife have both had carers before and certainly in terms of today's theme I find it very interesting the way we see care in this country or in the west in general. Um, we have this idea that it's something that will happen to us some point down the road many years from now but the reality is that that many people require care at various different ages and the wonderful thing about disability is that we will all be disabled one day more than likely um and so it's a real chance to try and explore the stigmas and the ideas that we have about disability and to really look at whether they're real or not okay a middle-aged woman peels off our socks and strips us layer by layer like she's fleecing sheep. The flakes swirl from my shin. The glossy scars on my arms are a reminder how deep you can cleave the flesh before the body asks the blood to swell of this lapse between what the body feels and the mind calls for in turn. She plies our skin with emollient thick as grease and we are left to sit in our sweat like chops spitting in the pan. The quietness that gathers when she locks the door behind her. And this piece of furniture is all that carries us adrift in our Pacific blue hoodies. Fingers shaking round our mugs as the gutters outside choke with ice. And we'll wake tomorrow in the same bare room. Our carer will come again and again to unwrap us until all that's left are tears streaming down our necks onto this sofa that holds us like a mother. I'm going to read a, a new poem now. Um, I've had chronic eczema since I was a child and I've always wanted to write a poem about what it's like to have this um, this medium between the internal and external body, your skin, what it means to have it be so fragile um, and for it to break so easily and for you to bleed so easily. So um, I, I finally wrote a poem about it, Blood. Just like the trees that erupt in long summers like these, the bark tightening to split into a nimbus of shards, Pulling apart the forest's quiet joy, I have found my body unwinding like ticker tape over basins and bathroom floors. The blood rising like resin to the surface of the skin, tacky and sweet like a spoiled peach. My knuckles slick when I wake, having pulled the fine skin of my eyelid apart in my sleep, my nails at my arms like a man on fire trying to stifle the flames, as if you can dig your way clear through to the other side. How even now my body gives over its warmth in smudged kisses on the pillow. 
I've left a galaxy of buckshot on the sheets that you've learned to blink over with dye, stripping back constellations that map the path back to a childhood spent wrapped in swathes of wet gauze to stop the creases of my arms yawning open like the hungered mouths of baby birds. I've been trying to deglove myself like a finger in the mechanism for 30 years, open mouthed at the mechanics of this body, the heart's winged flutter, its proof spilling over my fingertips, how I've barely been able to keep this life within me, within me. And um, talking about the way we see disability and the way we see bodies, um, this is a poem from my uh, second collection, The Terrible, about some of the fantasies, certainly, that people with chronic illnesses or disabilities or bodies that aren't performing the same way as other people, some of the fantasies that we have where we go. It's not that we want to leave our lives, just our bodies for the night. The childhood promises that refuse to be honoured, the parts of us that weep in bad weather. We unfasten our skin at the seams. It buckles as our sighs bleed out the bright room and we drift like balloons to the cracked ceiling. Far enough to feel the bundle of nerves slip from the flesh. And we never go anywhere but through the open window, past the silver threads of rain, to the simple cranium of street lights outside. We enter neither animal or neighbor, but the same glass boxes. We want nothing of desire or love, just the indivisible blink of wire in glass. I'm, I think I'm going to skip the next poem and go to the one afterwards. Um, so this next poem is um, another new one, and it's about a period in, in time that my mental health wasn't particularly good. And I've been trying to, with hindsight, recontextualize that experience, Daniel. That whole summer, stumbling through unlocked doors into the lives of people whose love I did not earn. Fumbling at affection with my sad stories and grazed hands, their flawed music and unassuageable thirst. How the sun filled the raised base of each shot glass like yolk, then swallowed itself into September how I started forgetting the names of those who cared for me and fucked over friends like cheap line breaks. The rain against the window woke me naked as October in the empty tub, curled in on myself like a fist. The knife resting over my thigh, the noise of policemen shouldering their way through November's front door, shouting a word a handful of syllables bleeding into the silence, how it sounded so peculiar, so foreign. I try a little bit and talk about the, the, pos the positives of disability and chronic illness because there, there really are positives there. Um, and certainly in the next two poems, um, they really focus on the connection I found with my with my wife and really single window is all about my relationship with my love with my wife to some extent and what being with another disabled person has taught me about myself and this is love she goes limp and falls into my arms like an important looking letter I help her to the bathroom and sit the other side of the door tearing nails between my teeth, clutching the phone like a safety rope. And this is love, how we live between the side effects of glittering pills, the wads of her dead hair snarled in the plug hole, 
The morning cigarette that shakes in her hand before her kiss once again says, whatever happens. I ring the ambulance when her head smacks the floor and in the crazed flutter of her lids, I see a million lives for us, each one perfect. I want to say thank you once again to, to Jenny and to, um, to some wonderful readers, to Julie, Claire, Catherine. Um, it's been fantastic and hopefully we'll have a little chat after this and, and talk about um, different things we, we thought about. Um, I'll end on this poem. This is um, a real poem about, about the narratives that disability means you're able to drop. Um, and for me, the biggest narrative is that your body needs to look a certain way. It needs to take up a certain amount of space. Um, you need to be doing certain things to be the right kind of person. And we see this kind of narrative embedded in advertising and marketing and social media and news. And when you're disabled and you immediately disqualify from this by, by being an amputee or by having fibromyalgia and Crohn's disease, it means you can really focus on the things in life that are actually real because this, this really isn't the beautiful. White sheets contain us in the illusion of containment and we don't screw like they do on TV. The Vaseline smeared lens groping bodies that gleam, the carefully placed size and glazed eyes of the beautiful swimming through the windows of gyms and pools like torchlight, lonely as hell. They will never love like this, our whole bodies into the earth of each other. We bury ourselves like readers in books, take each other apart and put each other back again and again. Cripples love best because love is an assembly and we have always been broken gluing our lives with glitter and card in darkened rooms. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Daniel, for um, such wonderful, um, you know, like such brilliant set of poems and um, including some of your new work and um, really just um, so blown away as you can see also um, the comments on the chat uh, if you have time to um, see what everyone's been saying about them and um, it, it's just like when I first uh, came across Single Window I was just so mesmerized because of the ways of seeing like they're giving us um, just many different ways of seeing life and and also um, the kind of assumptions that we make uh, for, about life and people and the stories and um, so um, I'm just going to uh, invite everyone to um, join us to, you know, like um, give up an applause to everyone's, um, you know, the uh, feature poets, wonderful um, uh, reading. And um, we will also um, remember to buy their books if you haven't, or buy a book for your friends, um, for these, uh, you know, like um, to encourage people to keep reading beautiful poetry. And um, shall we, uh, if you have questions, please, do feel free to, um, you know, like uh, put on the chat and um, we'll have um, other poets responding to, you know, like there's so many new thoughts about what poetry does uh, or how, where poetry can go um, with this event. So um, can I, uh, yes, um, if you wanted to unmute and let's give it a, a genuine applause. I know this is uh, still online, it's always uh, not, uh, to express our thanks. <laughs> it's really powerful. Um, I mean, I don't know if I can see, um, I hope I haven't missed any question from before, but um, I mean, one thing that I thought about is, um, you know, like uh, so many of you have um, talked in some ways about the body um, the taboo or of the body or relating to the body and um, you know when you write about it um, how do you sort of um, also emotionally distance yourself or contain your own emotions when you write and how do you see you know uh, 
how much do you think your reader should know you personally? Um, where do you particularly like your poem to go? Um, do you have, like, how do you approach that even? Would anyone want to respond, feel free. I feel like that links into um, this whole obsession I have with permissions at the moment. And, you know, what you said, how much do you think your reader should know about you? And how do you distance and contain? And I, I would just say, I don't. I try not to, like, of course, I always do a little bit, but but for me, the good poems, the special poems come mm -hmm. when I when I give myself permission about the stuff that's in, uncontainable, that's raw, that's difficult, that's traumatic, and it's finding strategies and ways in to do that in a, se in a way that's safe enough for me to still be able to do it and read without crying for the most part. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting that you kind of started talking about the relationship between the body and the self. And I think that's something that Daniel was really exploring a lot in those poems. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, in, in disability studies, we have this term body mind um, because the realistically, th there is no way to disconnect the two things. Um, Every, everything is processed through the mind and everything has a, a physical um, base or has a, some kind of physical effect. I mean, even when I look at my rather individual case, um, having a, a phantom, phantom sensations, phantom pain, my leg isn't there, but my brain still thinks it is. So um, I think when you, when especially you're talking about the body, the more you investigate it, the more you realize that a lot of these kind of arbitrary um, disconnections between things can actually be explored and, and there can be new material found in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I, I th can, can I step in? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, Julie. I think in, in my case, compared to Claire or Daniel or Catherine, <clears throat> I was writing about someone else's body, for example, with a poem Red Card. So that's another issue because do you have the right to talk, to write about someone else's, uh, in, my, in that case, it was, you know, my mother's addiction to alcohol. So when I wrote it, you know, I thought, God knows if I'm going to publish it. So let's just give it a try. And there was also my trauma as a child you know being separated from her so I still have a, a small legitimacy to talk about that but actually when the poem uh, got accepted for um, by a magazine she, I wanted to talk to her about it but she was actually hospitalized so it was really not the moment to talk about it so when I had to announce it to her I felt really really bad but she actually said that no on the contrary she was happy that it came out sort of you know and uh, if it could, if people could connect with a poem, even better, because she might, her experience might um, help other people. But uh, yes, there's also this ethical, in my case, the ethical side of writing about other people's, um, other people's body, I guess. Thank you. I, I guess I'll just add a little kind of controversial note that um, I, I, I first wrote about being a carer rather than, um, I think I had ME for years and I was arts editor for Disability Arts magazine. So I kind of, I'm very familiar with Disability Arts culture, but my first writing about uh, disability was, um, I, I made artwork about my own, my own experience, but I, I wrote my first novel about being a carer. And that was, that, that felt quite dodgy because um, it, my sister read it in one day and came out in a terrible rash because it's not just my experience, it's other people's as well. So it, it, it did feel quite difficult. But as far as, um, as, far as my poetry around my own, my own health, um, I, I, I've had a lot of people say, if it makes people feel better. And I, I, don't, I, I honestly want my poems to be poems, to be, you know, first and foremost, I want to be seen as a, as a poet and this is my subject matter, but so are a lot of other things. And, and I would hate it if, if they were kind of, let under the wire because of issues. So, um, and I think that's often the case that people kind of steer away because they think, oh, it's about this. And I hope they're good poems first, you know, and I, and, and I think tonight we've seen all these poems are fantastic, but um, I, I have a little caveat around that. It's just a little bug there. I can add something there, Claire. I was, I was gonna say, I think um, 
the different uh, when I'm speaking to other people there's a real different experience as well about writing poetry when you're a woman and what you write about and how that defines you I think men get given um, a lot more leeway when they write poems oh they're a poet first whereas women it seems to be it has to be about there's some kind of specificity that that attaches to them do you know what I mean yeah okay can I can I say yeah yeah sure uh I think I'm a coward because uh I don't like being in, in my body I always I often think uh, I'm trapped in my head and what I find with poetry is it allows me, as, po um, as Catherine's poem did uh, about the birds, I, allow, I like shape-shifting. I allow myself to escape this body. Um, and I love to be a swan or some other creature. Um, but I am still grounded in, in being a, a human woman. Um, that's just I want to say that I, I use poetry to escape this prison as I see it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, the take flight. Um, I think I saw some questions here. So should we go through a few of them? I think Joanne mentions about us reading these personal poems over and over again and events create new material for you. Anyone wants to comment on that? I would say not reading them necessarily, but listening to other people, actually, other people's work. Actually, I, I, while you were all reading, I was taking notes because I always get loads of ideas from poetry readings, other people's perspectives, or they're talking about the theme I've always wanted to write about and never done so. So it's more listening to other people rather than reading my own work again, over again and again and again, you know? <laughs> yeah, I feel quite similar. I always think I'm, I'm kind of really glad that I never became a mother because with my poems I'm like once they're written and they're dead to me like they're gone you know they can fend for themselves I, I don't I'm not interested in them anymore almost not quite but I, it's definitely the future work or the current work that's exciting mm -hmm. and that comes always 100% of the time always comes from reading other poets listening to other poets I would say for me so I agree with Julie on that wait now um, I, I've also seen some other questions about, uh, so Selda, Selda mentioned about poetry, other than poetry, are there any art forms or influences that inspire or change the ways you see and work right now? Ah. Well, I'm, I'm a visual artist as well as a poet, so that kind of, that fits me nicely. And I'm also, if anyone's interested, running a course at a uh, short course at uh, Poetry School on, on ekphrasis and around body image in particular. So if anyone's interested in that, it's uh, coming up in July. But I was, I, I mean, it's really interesting. I, 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 I was a visual artist first because I found words got me into trouble. And um, then I discovered that actually you can be quite obscure if you, if you, <laughs> you can use words in a way that don't, don't don't get you into trouble or that, that, that have a certain amount of space around them. But for a long time, it, um, I didn't even want to give visual work titles because that kind of limited your way into it too much. And I wanted the viewer to have that kind of space. So I guess as a poet, it's a way of still allowing mm -hmm. the reader to have that space, um, even though you've, you've nailed it with your language, but there's still gonna be some air for other people to get in. So that's the trick. Um, but I think that, that the two bounce off each other all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, one feeds the other. That's wonderful to know. Anyone, any, Emma, the poets too? Um, I think, oh, go ahead then, Daniel. Go ahead. Sorry, um, I was just gonna say, um, music was my first love. So I, um, I played guitar for a long time and I, before I did, creative writing I did a degree in music production um and I kind of got I I kind of found a roadblock in that there's only 12 notes in music and after a while everything sounds like something else it is impossible to be completely original um but with language you have a medium in in words that they're always changing contextually they're always shifting 
um and you have many more of them so that's why i moved over to poetry yeah brilliant julie oh i was just going to add so i'm i'm also inspired by music but i'm not a musician like daniel so i can't do much with that but i think it depends on the periods of my life for example if i go on holidays and uh, i'm visiting a lot of art galleries so of course i'm inspired by paintings or sculptures and well, for obvious reason, during lockdown, it was more cinema, watching films and everything. It really not only helped through uh, go through the lockdown uh, mentally, but also creatively. It gave me new material, really. And I've always been passionate about cinema. I studied it in high school. So I guess it was just coming back to a first love. Mm -hmm. I just like the love the way um, all of you have these, uh, you know, like, just looking for inspiration everywhere and also you know the passion across the art forms that kind of keep you, you know, keep with new ways of uh, reinventing things and um i also saw it like some other po uh, questions oh Wow, that's a very personal question. Julie, do you write in French too? <laughs> ah, that's a tricky one. Uh, no, I gave up when I was 17, something like that. But everyone is asking me this question. So actually, I felt a bit of pressure <laughs> to move back. And someone asked me, uh, an editor, if I was writing in French. So a few months ago, I tried again. Mm -hmm. And I submitted to a magazine. But it's been such a long time. And I'm much more into the UK and the Irish poetry scene. But it doesn't feel really right right now. Maybe it will come back one day, but I feel much more at ease writing in English. There's a, there's a wonderful question from Chaucer, a little way back up the chat that I just noticed. <laughs> Is that okay if we talk about that one? Yeah. So um, let me just uh, go back to that. It's like uh, Chaucer says, Is there any conscious strategy that you all use to protect yourself? from becoming ill after a poem is written or after you perform you, after you perform them? So, for, so the, uh, the reason I'm so interested in, in this is that for me, it's the writing of the poem that is the conscious strategy to protect myself from that trauma or whatever it was, uh, that, that piece of bad history, that piece of bad luck, that awful circumstance. I find that in writing about it, I transform it now that can't be 100% true it doesn't mean I don't still feel things about those events that went on like say I was writing about an abusive relationship it doesn't mean suddenly I'm completely freed from that thing but I but I do think that the strategy of writing about it about making art from it for me personally has been extremely helpful if that makes sense Yes, for me, it's more or less like Catherine, you know, it's more, it's not when I'm performing it or whatever, it's more as I'm writing it. So, for example, the, the poem Red Cards, uh, I need my strategy, I guess, when I'm really talking about very personal things or difficult ones is to try to use a metaphor or a symbol or another subject to talk about it. So in Red Card, I used football, you know, as a way to not to focus just on, on the episode itself. In another one, which is in my... Um, pamphlet and she deals with my difficult relationship with my dad I'm focusing on woodcocks you know in fact he was hunting woodcocks so either as I say a symbol or another theme it's not to avoid talking about it but I guess to get some distance and protect myself I guess from some things so that's my coping <laughs> strategy anyway I've made myself cry as I read which is the most embarrassing thing ever but um, when, I'm, when I've said that, that I've made myself cry and it's embarrassing, other people have come back and said, well, that's really good, isn't it? That you're kind of reigniting those, those feelings that they are still, you know, they, they, they are still powerful. Um, I, I remember having this conversation with Malarashi about um, the, the, the way that, that a poem can be a little kind of time capsule that can, can return you to things, which is a very magical thing, isn't it? That you can re recapture uh, emotions and times and people that, that we don't have. Um, so it, maybe it should be emotional sometimes. Maybe that's the point of it, you know, rather than something that we should all be really proficient about it and 
you know, have strategies that it doesn't affect us. Uh, maybe it's okay to be affected. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, with, 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 during my cancer, I would just weep all the time, you know, really embarrassingly in the middle of conversations just before. And when I've been teaching quite often, if someone's put, if someone writes something good, I'll start crying. And it almost, be, you know, it's like that bloke on the pot, pot, pottery throwdown thing that you know, just kind of blubber. And I think that's okay. I think, you know, crying's okay. Big emotional is okay. Big emotions. I think that's a very powerful thing, and how you translate that into art. Um, just um, also, I, I, I hope I'm not going to take up too much time. But a very quick question, like you know, I notice a lot of you, um, actually all of you, uh, teach uh, from time to time, or you run some workshops or offer some workshops here and there. You know, does it become easier when you <laughs> when you teach and know everything, <laughs> uh, or you know, how does it feel? Do you mean easier to write, Jenny? Yeah, I was going yeah. to ask. Maybe <laughs> easier to write, to be a writer, don't we? I think that's... What... You go for it, Claire, go for it. Yeah, oh, I, I think what I've realised as I teach is, is that that's as creative an occupation mm -hmm. as, as being a poet, you know? It, it, it's something that um, I had this terrible... And my mum was a teacher, she always said you should teach. I was like, no, no, I want to be an artist. But actually, I've, you know, <laughs> it's taken a long time to realise that teaching is is the nuts. You know, it's just that it's so important, and and being part of other people's creativity is just the best. So um, I don't know what the question was, but that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Judy. Uh, I just I'm not sure about the answer. I'm not sure. I don't think it made me. A better poet unfortunately but it, make me, it makes me see things from another angle yes I've got a teacher's mind and when I read a, a collection or I listen to that actually I wrote down two poems that the two, two of you read and I thought mm, I'm going to include that into my next handout because my students will like this or this or this so in terms of analyzing it yes I guess maybe it makes me reconsider some aspects of my work or tips I should use but I'm not sure I put always put them into practice that's the thing I, I mean I'm teaching for me is a real vocation and the teaching came before the poetry came for me and weirdly I only became a poet because I was teaching young people how to write poetry so it's a really asked about it way of coming to to writing in the first place but I, I think for me, the boat that, that one of the really great things in terms of how teaching feeds into my creative practice is, uh, you know, my writing is that I'm learning from my pupils all the time. Yeah. And they're better than they think they are by, you know, I'm often shocked, you know, I'll give them 15 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever to write. And I'm just staggered with what they come out with and think, God, I could never do that. Um, but I, yeah, I, I love, I love hearing what the, Groups are amazing. Groups of human beings are amazing. And I work with adults a lot. Groups of children are great too, but uh, working with adults, you can give them any problem and a group will solve it for you in ways that are much better than you could have come up with on your own. So true. Um, yeah, so I just noticed also Mark, Mark Bosley mentioned about, do all the poets find time to write or engage with poetry daily, which I find a fascinating question as well. <laughs> Anyone bold enough to address that question? I don't mind answering that. Um, <laughs> I, when I started writing, I, I was very kind of like, um, ambitious like I want to I want to be in magazines by this period I need to get poems out and I want to get a pamphlet published and I want to do xyz um and I I think there's there's such a thing as kind of working too hard sometimes and uh the kind of hind brain that you need to work problems out and make abstract connections it needs rest so I I have an agreement with myself now where as long as I think about poetry or I read poetry or I do a little bit of drafting every day, I cut myself some slack. But that's that's my baseline. As long as I do that, because for mm -hmm. me, I've found I don't know how anyone else, but I found momentum is really important. And if I stop writing for a while, that can just go on and on and on. Mm. Yeah, I recognize myself a little bit in that, Daniel. I was also a dictator with myself. <laughs> At the beginning, because again, I wanted to get published. I wanted to do this, to that, to that. After I started, uh, I said, not giving up, but you know, 
as you said, you know, today I'm not writing, but I'm going to read a pamphlet. So it's still productive in a way. And I'm learning from it anyway. So, so I'm not writing every day because I, I hate habits in general, even outside mm -hmm. writing. But I always, I'm teaching poetry. I'm doing a PhD on poetry. So there's always a way every day I engage with literature one way or another. I'm trying to be, to impose less things on myself now about writing habits or whatever. I th I tend to think of everything as writing, <laughs> so that gets me out of it. <laughs> um, so I think if I'm going for a walk or I'm definitely reading poetry, that uh, or I'm I don't know cooking a good meal or whatever. I'm I'm doing I'm I'm doing the work I need to do to get the poems out. And some sometimes I write a poem a month, and sometimes I write a poem a day, every day for a week, and sometimes nothing for ages. You know, so it's I I. Yeah, I think it's, in, I, I don't wait to be hit by the lightning bolt of inspiration or anything silly or romantic like that. But um, but I do try to be kind to myself and self-compassionate about my practice and what it is that I need to do. And that's different at different times. You know, when I finish my pamphlet manuscript, I need to take a lot of nourishment in by reading, by resting. Um, and then at times, you know, like just right now, I'm really busy writing, but it changes all the time. Mm, thank you so much. I uh, have one last question from the audience. Um, let's, uh, you know, see if anyone wants to re respond, feel free, but I know that some of you might be, may need to go soon. So um, did anyone, uh, B, B Nadley said, uh, did anyone of you find, uh, start off writing by trying to escape the reality of your own lives with your words and then realize you only found your authentic voice by focusing on your writing on the struggles that you're facing? I don't think I've ever made anything up in my life. It's always been about the real stuff, um, n never about escape. I definitely had that experience that at the beginning I wanted to write beautiful poems mm. and I admired beautiful poems and I... You do, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? I was concentrating on beauty, not ugliness. And uh, I needed to ugly them up a bit. And I actually needed to, when I had some mentoring with Jo Bell, who's extremely generous and brilliant in these ways. And she was like, you're playing it safe. Like what, you know, why are you playing it safe? You need to go digging in the trauma. That's where all the gold is buried. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, I'm laughing about that, but that, obviously that was very hard as well in some ways, but that is where the good work has come from. She was right. Not that I'm advocating everybody should do that because I would hate to be liable for anyone's counselling bills. Um, but it, for me, that was great. It's a great idea to, to stop this preoccupation with prettiness, beauty, with the lyrical eye, with all, you know, and, and to actually mess about with some, of, with some of the stuff that we all have going on in our lives, you know, and those, those are the poems that have turned out to resonate, I think, more with other people. Yeah. Um, with that, um, any any if there's nothing um, that you want to add, um, I think like thank you so much for today. It's been just wonderful hearing all these uh, conversations and your brilliant poems. And um, I just also th wanted to thank the audience as well for you know being here and being so supportive and um, and uh, hope that you will continue to you know um, join us uh, from. Uh, next time for example and also to keep watching out and uh, follow the the news and the um works of these writers so um the next reading that we have next time actually just to um kind of help you save the day is 13th of may in the evening 7 30 we have uh, liz berry and lucy mercer and sarah Lee as judge um so i'll, I'll uh, send out the kind of event flyer very soon but it was just it's just such a brilliant um, um evening and thank you very much for your patience it took on uh, quite uh, we we discuss a lot of uh, different aspects about <laughs> the topic and um thanks a lot and i'll uh, post up i think the writers have also recommended some books but we didn't have time to go through it but i'll put it on the facebook or show us Oh, wow, Claire's got all these wonderful books <laughs> to show. Oh, wow. Oh, I love that ESJ Tasman. <laughs> oh, gosh, Ricky Morris. Brilliant. <laughs> or would you like to win? I think maybe, yeah, I'll put it up. <laughs> I don't know. No, just Fiona's beautiful, beautiful book, Vital Capacity, that also feels really nice. Oh.
want to share that. Vital capacity beyond the Larkin. Beautiful, gorgeous. And sorry, Catherine Barrett, <laughs> Catherine. Uh, so many, I've, I've, I've held most of them up, but like this, this, I mean, I know Vicky was reading uh, from this last time you did, I think it was the last session of what we read now, am I right? Mm -hmm. um, this is currently up for the Saboteur Award and I, I've just inhaled it in one go mm -hmm. and I'm now having to go back carefully and reread each poem and hold each one up to the light. I honestly go out and buy this book and read it. It's the best thing. One of the best things I've ever read. And then go and vote for her in the SAB Awards, if you can. Julie, you've got, I feel, I, I'll put your, Julie send me the Yes, list. I don't want to monopolize everyone's, uh, yeah. but uh, I particularly like, let's say just one, you know, all about our mothers. So I, I got it on the Kindle by nine pence mm -hmm. with, uh, it's basically Mary Mulholland, Simon Madrell and Vasiliki Albedo. And I really liked this anthology because it's talking about complex relationship mm -hmm. with, uh, with mothers, not just, you know, all the perfect relationship with wonderful mothers and everything is beautiful. It, it's captured the complexity of such a relationship and I love that you know it was not just all white and perfect and wonderful <laughs> definitely thank you a uh, very comprehensive list Daniel in case you've got any <laughs> got any to, to show up but I am I'm running a whatsapp group for Ocean Fong's new book um, mm -hmm. Time is a Mother so if any of you want to join that we're only kind wow. of 10 poems in so I'm reading that and uh, reading a book by an American poet called Matthew Zapruder called Father's Day, which is really good. Mm, brilliant. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And, um, you know, like, um, wonderful evening. I'm going to turn off the recording.